Hey, welcome to the F14 Tomcast episode three. Today in this episode, we're gonna be talking about the AUG-9 radar and the AIM-54 Phoenix missile. Our guest today is Wahoo, who was a well-known F-14 Rio back in the day. He's gonna talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of the AUG-9 and the AIM-54. Now it's not all nuts and bolts either. Wahoo's got some great missile shoot stories about how he proved the capabilities of the F-14's weapon system. Here we go. All right, everybody, welcome to the F-14 TomCast. I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch, and today we are joined by my my uh, co-host, Bio, and our guest, Wahoo. Hey, Crunch, I'm uh, Dave Baronic, call sign Bio. I'm an F-14 Rio. I accumulated uh, 2,500 F-14 flight hours and three squadron tours, and like Crunch, I was also a Top Gun instructor. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about the AUG-9 radar in the F-14A and the AIM-54 Phoenix. Our guest is Ken Janader, call sign Wahoo, a former F-14 Rio who joined the fleet in the Tomcat's early years and progressed into squadron command, accumulating more than 2,800 F-14 flight hours. Wahoo is known as an expert, expert on the Tomcat, and he's going to take us back to the days when multi-track capability was new and we'll also discuss some of the evolution of this potent weapon system. Welcome to the F-14 TomCast, Wahoo. Well, thank you, Bio. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, to get us started, tell us where you're from and how you got into the F-14. Okay, interesting story about that. You know, I grew up in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, just about 50 miles northwest of uh, Philadelphia. You know, and I was uh, always interested in, you know, you know, engineering type things. I had an erector set when I was growing up, you know, and I was always in the basement kind of the designing things like that. And then I got really interested in the space industry, um, you know, uh, Neil Armstrong and, you know, and uh, all the other, uh, you know, first seven astronauts, you know, and as a, I'm like six or seven or eight years old at the time, and I'm looking, you know, they're all fighter pilots, you know, from the Air Force, Marine Corps, or Navy, and they all went to test pilot school. And then when I was 11 years old, in July of 1969, you know, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. And so I go, I want to be an astronaut. And to be an astronaut, you have to be a fighter pilot and you have to go to test pilot school. At least that's what I knew at that particular time. So I always wanted to do that, you know, and so I said, OK, I, I need to go, you know, choose the service. You know, I liked the Navy because my dad was a world, in World War II in the Navy. He was on an, an AO and he was refueling aircraft carriers in World War II in the Pacific. So I decided to go either Navy or Marine Corps, who had the best option, you know, for Rios, because I took my I didn't wear glasses until I was 16 and took a driver's test. And I had my left eye was 2040, you know, it wasn't 2020. So I just realized at that time, well, it's not going to be 2020 uncorrected. So I can't be a pilot. I have to be a weapons system operator or Rio. And so I applied to the Naval Academy and I went there and this so happened for the class of 1971, actually, uh, to start in 71, class of 75, it was during the Vietnam and there was still a draft and things like that. So there were 15,000 people that wanted to go to the Naval Academy. So they made a requirement that year. You had to have 2020 uncorrected vision in order to be medically required for the Naval Academy. Wow. Okay. And wow, I didn't. That is not the case now. No, oh, wow. it's not the case now. <laughs> anyway, that's what it was in 71. And so I, right when I was in Philadelphia taking my medical and I went right next door to the ROTC. And uh, they took me in a heartbeat. They said, you don't need to be 2020 uncorrected. But now I didn't have a, a university because I only wanted to go to the Naval Academy. And this is in December of 1970. I'm only about five months from graduating high school. So I quickly put applications together to University of Virginia, Penn State University, because I was in Pennsylvania and University of Rochester, because I had applications from them through science awards in high school. And I got accepted in all three. So I went to University of Virginia. And after my first year in ROTC in Virginia, the Naval Academy came to visit me. Now they wanted me to come to the Naval Academy. Okay. And I said, boy, after my first year in University of Virginia, I said, uh, you didn't choose me on the first round. I'm not going to choose you on the second round because I had a great ROTC <laughs> unit. 
Um, and we just got a new ROTC commander coming in who I really, really liked. And I said, you know, I really like being in the civilian uh, university and Virginia was a great school. Anyway, I um, went through, I was the battalion commander of my ROTC unit, uh, my fall semester, my, uh, my last year in college. And, you know, I wanted to go aviation, but although my uh, professor in naval science was surface warfare, he wanted me to go nuke power because I was taking engineering. Of course, they, they and, all say and, that. And Admiral Rickover was up there, so he wanted me to do that. And I said, no, if I would even do that and Rickover selected me, if he would, and I turned him down, that would be hell on wheels. And I don't want to do that. So I said, aviation is where I want to go. And he sent me down to a friend of his who was an air wing commander in Oceana. Okay. And so that even convinced me more, more to go aviation. So now I get to Pensacola, you know, they revamped the uh, syllabus in VT-10. So it was six months holding period until we started. But when it got to the class, you know, uh, they said, okay, for the Rios, there's 12 in our class, you know, only two get F-14 and only the other 10 get F-4s. So I knew I had to study hard if I wanted to get F-14s. I needed to finish, finish top of my class if I wanted to have a chance. And fortunately, it worked out that way. I was number one out of 12, and I chose going F-14s. And I wanted to go West Coast because I've only been on the East Coast. And I really had never been out to the West Coast much. So I went out there and started the uh, in April of 1978. I started in VF-124. You know, and uh, they had some brand new F-14s at that time. I know VF-1 and 2 only had F-14s at that time in a squadron, but VF-111 was getting them, right? When I was out there, they had only one F-14 on the line and they had 11 F-4s. So I got put in kind of an accelerated uh, class a little bit, you know, trying to get us through in about six or seven months, um, just because, not because they were going on deployment, but going to a brand new F-14 squadron. So I got assigned to VF-111 in December of 1978. At that time, we had six F-14s and six F-4s on the flight line, but we're scheduled to go on deployment on June of the following year. So we got these brand new F-14s out of Calverton flying in with a VF-111 paint on them, replacing the F-4s on our flight line, you know, before we went on deployment. So when we deployed- So wait, go ahead. did you get any joy rides in the Phantom? You know, I didn't then, but I did later on when I was okay. a top gun instructor. Right. Okay, I got F-18 and, and F-4, and I'll tell you a little bit of story about that when it gets to it. But Okay. Um, anyway, um, brand new F-14s. We, uh, had, we craned them on. Okay, at that point, it was a different concept because you took 12 F-14s from two squadrons, the whole seven, A-7 squadrons and everything, and it was too hard to just go out and SoCal and, you know, and uh, get worked up there. So we craned every year plane on. And then we, the carrier went to Hawaii and that's where we did all our CQ. We flew a lot of airplanes ashore and back and forth. Then we did day and night CQ before we actually then went on deployment. It's a different way of deploying at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so it gave me an opportunity to be around the Hawaiian op area using the aug nine radar, kind of seeing all the Island chains and all that kind of stuff. And it was kind of an interesting, but I'll, we'll get, when you get into the AUG-9, I'll say it was a huge improve, improvement over the F-8 radar. Because when I went through a VT-86, that's what the Rios trained on, the old F-8 radar, uh, which was a, and then you go to the AUG-9. I mean, it was like a steroids improvement of what a yeah. radar could do. And it was just yeah. wonderful. We'll get into that later. Uh, but anyway, that got in, got me into my first squadron. So that's how I got into the aviation. That's how I got to be a fighter Rio. And that's why I chose fighters and VF-111 is my first squadron. Man, what a crunch. We are definitely hearing some cool stories, aren't we? About yeah. How people and, got and, there. and I think we both know that we got some other good ones coming up that I think the listeners <laughs> are really going to like when we, when we get to them. So, oh, yeah. so now Wahoo, as we, as we look at, you, you mentioned, you know, you talked about the, the radar being awesome compared right to the F8, F4, and all that. Get, for the listeners, let's go through, for the AUG-9, I mean, it was a sea change in radar technology compared to the stuff that's out there right now. Can you walk through, the listeners, basically high level, the different radar modes and the displays well, that are available? The stuff that's out there right now back in the 1970s. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, compared to, you know, <laughs> maybe not to today, but back back then it was completely different, right? Um, well, if you could just talk us through the radar modes and the displays you had in the back compared to the front seat and uh, just let the listeners know where we are. Okay, and uh, okay, this, this is the way I approached it in April of 78. I wanted to, 
you know, do my very best, just like everybody does. So I studied the NATOPS manual and everything. And it was just like, you know, reading a thousand page book on how the radar works compared to the F-8 radar, which had about 15 pages in it. But anyway, you know, the AUG-9 was an excellent system. I liked the tactical instrument display because it was a huge situational builder. I mean, all the information on there was almost like having a HUD in the back seat for a Rio, okay? You couldn't see out the front seat of the airplane, but you had a radar that really shined out the front and gave you huge SA, you know, and it gave you a whole lot of information in there, you know, all the airspeed altitude and all that kind of stuff, but also gave you, you know, the ability for multiple modes, which was just very interesting because in the F-8 radar I learned on, it was just a pulse search type of capability, and that's all that you really had. Oh. I love it, Bio. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So the, Give, giving me a visual of what it looks the, like. <laughs> the big round scope is the tactical information display, the TID, that uh, Wahoo's talking about. And then he's going to get to the other one. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a big, big dish that you're looking right into. And you have a little joystick that you work with. And so it's like having a little control stick in the back. And, you know, this is really before HOTAS, hand on stick and throttle, you know, all the kind of things without having to move your hands. But you had that joystick and your left hand was pretty much running everything on the left side, you know, with entering and all that kind of stuff. It was almost like having, you know, hands on a control stick and hands on a control panel type of thing. And then I love that concept because you were using everything. But the tactical instrument, uh, uh, instrument display, big SA builder, big screen, you know, it was designed to, to track 24 targets at one time. You carried three missiles on the F-14. It could launch, you could launch six you know, uh, AIM-9, AIM-54, rather, you know, and track six at the same time, which was a huge capability instead of just locking on one and shooting one at a time. But they did have another capability to it, a detail, detailed data display. We called it a DDD, which was just right above the TID. And that had a raw radar capability, which I liked because I was learning on a raw radar in the, AUG, in the F-8 radar and training command. So you could do pulse search on that. and was a really good pulse search radar. I learned to really optimize that. And that was probably almost my favorite mode was pulse search. Now the pilot couldn't see that, okay? The pilot could see a repeat of the TID, the tactical information display, but the pilot could not see what was on the DDD. And you got pulse search there and PD search. PD search to me had too much clutter in the background and too much challenging. And I didn't use PD search all that much, but I love pulse search. And I love the trackball scan. So that was the two modes that I used primarily. And so now you get into crew coordination because the pilot could see the tactical information display. So you could just reference thing on there. But if you were really tracking things on the DDD, you had to be more explanatory to the pilot what you were seeing because the pilot didn't have that capability to see that, you know, their raw radar. So I developed, you have to really develop a really good crew coordination between you and your pilot. And when I got assigned to VF-111, I got assigned to Jim Flex to Staffney, which you know, many of you may know. He also was a Top Gun instructor, you know, prior to me getting to Top Gun too. But he was a, a super JO because uh, we had a lot of super JO lieutenants in VF-111 that actually hung on for a third deployment to get F-14s because they had two deployments in F-4s and they wanted to fly F-14s. So there was an option. You know, Pete Valco was one of those, and then Jim DeStaffney, and uh, Rip Serhan, and um, uh, uh, Bozo, uh, he, he actually, uh, you know, flew F-14s in the movie Top Gun. And so we had about six of the Super JOs in VF-111. And being a brand new nugget, I got assigned to, to Flex DeStaffney, and we kind of clicked. I mean, I couldn't have had a better crew coordination partner. And to me, that what made a good F-14 air crew, having a good pilot, good Rio, you know, that could just trust each other, kind of think for each other and know what each other wants before you actually ask it. So uh, that's a little bit about the, uh, the radar scopes, the TID and the DDD. Okay, so I'm dying to bring this up. Okay. You mentioned the little, the little hand control stick in the back seat. Now, uh, I've watched JAG a couple of times. I think probably a lot of our... Uh, Audience has watched JAG because it's got F-14s once in a while, you know, so you'll you'll put in the time in case you see this Tomcat. And they show harm flying the F-14 from the back seat. How about addressing that, Wahoo? Okay, not only just that, but if you look at the movie Top Gun, Maverick flew it from the back seat too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that was a that was a 
a fake out, you know. Yeah, that I mean, was a fake out, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the control was in the center. The stick was in the center. Where the stick is in the front seat of the cockpit, of course, it wasn't quite as big. It was a much shorter stick instead of the longer stick. But it, you could say your hand was in the right position, you know, just like a pilot's position for the right yeah, hand. Yeah, but could you fly the airplane with it? Tell no, us. No, you okay, couldn't. You could you. fly the radar. You can't fly the airplane. <laughs> but you could make you th- you could think you were, but no, and, you know. And this was, and this was one of the things too. You know, a lot of times, so I my, I got to know some Air Force guys along the way too, and they had a stick in the back on most of their fighters. You know, and, and they said, "You mean you sit in the back seat of the F-14 and you have no control over flying that airplane?" You no, know, how can you do that? I said. This is my job. I am the uh, radar intercept officer, you know, and it's a crew coordination thing. You know, I trust my pilot implicitly. I don't need to have a control stick in the back to land the airplane. If the pilot has a problem, you know, we work together to land the airplane and the pilot has the stick. That's a little bit of a sidebar. But yeah, to answer your question, Bio, no, that control stick, you know, you can make it look like you're flying the airplane, but (laughs) nope. You have absolutely zero control over what the airplane does uh, yeah. as far as, you know, aerodynamically, I should say. You know? uh, people still ask that. So I think uh, I think some, you know, that may be uh, inf- new information for some we, people. We, we can just put it to bed. That there <laughs> yeah. is no two control Tomcats out there. The first time you fly it, you're on your own and there's no no way to do it from the back, despite nope. what the movies show. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, getting back to the uh, some of those radar modes, I know that you mentioned that one of your favorites was you, you said your favorites were pulse search and track wall scan. If I'm I'm not mistaken, right. that's correct. Now, when when you actually employed, say, the AIM fifty four or the AIM seven, now you can't do it from pulse search. You have to be in a basically a a, a mode that supports shooting the radar. Right. And, you know, you're either going to be in a, a single target track STT mode, or you're going to be in some form of track wall scan. Um, I, I recall that when we would go down range, and maybe you want to talk about some missile shoots or something here, but if you're going to shoot an AIM-54, you can't just be, you know, yanking the airplane and then shooting in under a high G turn. That the, 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 There were some limitations on the radar. Can can you talk comment on that and just talk us through that a little bit? I'll talk through that just a little bit, and then I'll get into a missile shoot. You know, one thing that, of course, it was new technology. Okay, the AUG-9 was new technology at the time. No, but latency. I don't know if your reader, uh, your listeners understand latency, but when you move something quickly, how quickly does that display keep up with it? You know, we get into that in a number of other different things. And that's one thing the AUG-9 didn't do super well. If you made an aggressive mood in an F-14 and you were in track wall scan, it took a while, a couple seconds for it to settle down and to give you the display again accurately. It wouldn't necessarily drop the track, but for a couple seconds, it wouldn't be totally accurate. And so that was the challenge you had to learn because you had these scan volumes and they'd kind of chunk along instead of smoothly move along. So as you had it up at uh, you know 40 degree elevation or what 40 uh, degree either side of he- headline, it would kind of chunk along and follow as you, you, know, you know, move the fighter. And you got used to that and it was acceptable. You know, when you had track wall scan targets, say you had two or three or four out there, you know, it would usually keep a track. Sometimes it would kind of put a little thing losing track. But then when you stabilized in your new heading and F-14, it would pick it up again. So I would say the AUG-9 was a really super capable radar at its time, okay, Mm -hmm. in the 1970s. You know, if you're thinking of technology now in the 2021s, it's very different. But at that time, it was a huge leap in technology and gave the F-14 a huge capability over an F-4 and F-8 in that. And I loved it for that, even though it had some of its own challenges, you know, and keeping up those multiple tracks and, and things like that. But I would say it did a really credible job. Um, yeah, and you, and you mentioned one of, the, one of the neat things I always thought. It was, you know, we advertised that you could uh, track in track wall scan mode. You could track uh, 24 targets. Right. You could employ against six. And, uh, you know, you might be like, well, why only six? Well, you ran out of missiles at that point, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you shot all six that you could carry. You've all, all, that's all the weapon stations you have. But uh, if, imagine you were doing that aggressive turn. Like you, you're, you're, you're pointing in this direction. You make an aggressive turn, 45 degrees. You got these guys, and boom, you don't wait for it to settle out. You come and try and shoot an AIM-54 at it. What do you think is going to happen? 
Well, you know, the AIM-54, you know, was, receives information from the AUG-9 en route. So uh, I didn't do an aggressive missile shoot like that, but I think it would launch fine and go on, you know, and then maybe pick up the links. Now, if you were in close, there was an ACM mode, which was a one second launch to eject. And that required lock. You know, if you were in close and you were, say, eight miles or 10 miles away and took a lock, you could launch the AIM-54 in the called ACM mode with one second launch. But normally the AIM-54 was a three second launch to eject. And that was just so the AIM-54 could receive information from the TID before it launched so that once it launched, it could pick up that information and then fly its path. You know, for those listeners out there, the AIM-54, you know, goes vertical almost and goes up to about 80,000 feet and then cruises supersonic and then does a dive at the end. That's just the profile that the missile took. And so that's why you needed a radar with a wide scan volume to keep those that information link to the AIM-54s going while a missile is in the air until it gets to its target. But, you know, I don't know the exact answer if you had one launched and did an aggressive move. You know, but I think it would still pick it up and keep uh, flying, at least in, in my understanding. You, you know, from Crunch asking that, didn't they tell us you had, they wanted you to be wings level for three seconds or six seconds before launch, something like that, just to let everything settle out? Because Wahoo, this, this may remind you, windshield wiper effect. Do you remember hearing that in the rag? If the F-14 turns, the AUG-9 at first thinks it's the target turning. Do you remember uh, experiencing a, that? A I little mean, so, bit. I, so I, TWS, you said the word latency, mm -hmm. track while scan, the, com the computer processing speed, all that did contribute to some uncertainty. But like you said, that was it was designed in the 60s. That was as good as it got. And it could track 24 targets. It just wasn't. You just it just had some limitations. Well, and the twenty four targets were non maneuvering targets. You know, we'll have to <laughs> throw that in there too. Because if you had fighter maneuvering twenty four fighter maneuvering targets, it probably couldn't handle it. But the AUG nine was designed for the the Soviet uh, Union at that time before you know it was called, and they had Bear and Badger and and Bison and Cub bombers. You know, and so really it was designed to go against them which aren't aggressive maneuvering targets. You know, if you look at how airplanes were designed, you know, it was, you know, both sides, both us and the Russians, they designed it for the threat. And the F-14 was designed for the Soviet bomber threat. And the AUG-9 was designed to tackle that big threat. And so that's why it was designed to tackle 24 targets at one time and launch six AIM-54, you know, and track those, but really more at a non-maneuvering type of target, you know, maybe coming in at higher speed. Uh, but that was the capability. You know, if you had aggressive fighters out there, it was a different problem. Yeah, makes sense. Now, I, I think you hit on it. I'm going to, from the from the front seat point of view, you know, I was I was the pilot in this group, so I was in the front seat. And I didn't, I couldn't see as much as you guys could see in the back. And I have to be honest, there were plenty of times where I was just going downrange. My Rios will tell you that sometimes they're like, Crunch don't know what the heck's going on. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> you guys, you'd see stuff in the back and I'd be like, I, I don't really know. I'm kind of having to to he listen to the radio and listen to the comms and figure it out. Um, but you know what I, I did have is I, I had the, the trigger in the front mm -hmm. uh, and I had my <laughs> repeater. But you guys had more of the, the modes. You also had a launch button in the back. Um, what? Now, when you were doing missile shoots or when you were employing, what, what were the business rules in the cockpit? Who would shoot the radar missiles? Okay. It would really depend on who the pilot was. Because I'll tell you, when I went through the 124, I had a lot of F-8 pilots that were instructors. And the F-8 was a single seat, no fighter. And they did everything. you know. And so Rabbit Campbell was one of those uh, pilots in, in the RAG when I went through the RAG. They wanted to talk on the radars, you know, radios. You know, Usually the Rio talked on the radios. You know, but, you know, when you get an F-8 pilot in there, they want to do everything. So getting to your question, you know, and nothing against them because the F-8 was the last gunfighter. And I, I support that. But it's crew coordination. And with my pilots, we worked it that if it was a radar missile, okay, the Rio would launch it with the launch button in the back. If it was IR or guns, okay, then the pilot would launch it in the front. So the pilot really had the guns in the AIM-9. You know, AIM-7 was a, a kind of a negotiator thing, but usually in, in, in my crew coordination, that was a real launch on the AIM-7. And with the AIM-54, it was almost exclusively the Rio because we never really did many scenarios where we did launch an ACM mode of the AIM-54. 
Okay, so it was really, then that's how we uh, divided it. So I had responsibility and my pilots agreed with this. So this is a crew coordination thing. And when I flew with different pilots, it was a little bit different, but pretty much standard within the squadron. And that's how we worked it. Interesting. I mean, but like you said, it was uh, it was a crew coordination because because in my experience, crunch along the way. uh, It was environment specific. And a lot of times uh, I would plan for the pilot to launch because he could see out in front of us, make sure the wingman wasn't coming over, that he had everything set up. Um, Anyway, but like but like Wahoo said, it was something that you needed to discuss and crunch. You called it business rules. That's a good term. Yeah, it, visit. Well, it, I guess it was uh, more of an yeah. attack SOP. Uh, I know that when uh, later, as uh, it was probably when I was at Top Gun or so, we really, really defined as like, okay, pilot's going to pull the trigger. And it was merely for that reason, just like you said, you got a clear field of view and make sure yeah. that uh, you aren't shooting your wingman down. Really was what yeah. it came down to. And uh, okay. oh, go ahead. I want to get to some flying stories. Okay, yeah. well, well, one of the things here while we're talking the AUG-9, one of the modes I love was the vertical scan lock-on, VSL. And for your listeners, that really came out of AIMVAL ACEVAL, which was in the middle 70s. F-14s flying against F-15s. And it was kind of like, what, what works the best? You know, and, you know, they fly against each other one day and they come back, lessons learned. What can we do to the AUG-9 radar to, to, to challenge this problem? And so VSL, vertical scan lock-on, was one of those modes that really came out of that. And that's where you just put the lift vector of the F-14 on the target, hit VSL, and as the radar vertically scans, it locks it up. And I think between myself and the pilot, we used that mode as much as anything in a dynamic environment. Because you didn't have to put the nose on the fighter, which is the way you usually have to do it. Nose of the fighter on the target. You just have to put the lift vector on, and then you could get a lock on for so either an AIM-7 or an AIM-9. VSL commanded the radar, for, for the listeners, commanded the radar to search low, which was an altitude band right in front of the airplane, or VSL high. Yeah, I think and it went in, down yeah, go ahead, it went down to about 50 degrees fight, low or 55 degrees high. So Yeah, and in a dogfight, that's often where the, uh, the, the target would be. Somewhere on the lift vector. Well, remember, there I mean, were actually three of them. There was uh, VSL low, VSL high, which were collect- selected in the back, and pilot VSL, which was a momentary depression of the right throttle yeah. button, if I remember right. Oh, right. okay. And so, because uh, in the front, you had pulse, uh, you could take an STT or hit it for a, a VSL, pilot VSL, yep. which was now the thing was, I remember VSL high was a higher, it right. could go even higher on the lift vector, which was usually better. Um, and I don't remember the numbers. I wish I had it. I bet. Uh, I think 55 high, because if you were in lag, yeah. I think VSL high was 55 high, which was really high for the radar. And you could get a lock on as you're coming around. And the AIM 9s at that time, you know, had that capability to do that. Yeah. And I think that's what gave the F 14 a, a, an advantage in an ACM flight, a flight, in my opinion, the VSL, as far as getting a quick lock, quick lock on for like an AIM 9 shot. Yeah. So how about when you went through the Top Gun class, were you, uh, were they, were they talking about, you know, use track wall scan, use pulse search? Uh, tell us a little bit about the AUG-9 in the power projection mode. Okay. When I went through Top Gun as a student, this was 1980, yeah. you know, yeah. we actually had more F4s in the class than we had F14s. So it was interesting, you know, Top Gun teaching, they had to teach radar tactics for both F14 and F4. Now I was teamed with a, uh, our, Air wing, uh, VF-111 or VF-51 was our, uh, you know, our, the other F-14 in our air wing. And so we were in a section of F-14s, but there were a number of Marine Corps and also Navy F-4 sections in our class too. And so what we did in Top Gun 2 when I was a student there, we also did some mixed section work, you know, putting an F-14 and an F-4 together. You know, and I know we did this later when the F-18 came in. We had mixed section work between F-14 and F-18, too. And that really kind of, I think, gave us, and I won't say an advantage, but when you put an F-4 and an F-14 together, you can take the best of both, you know, and you can give a capability as a section that you can't get with two F-14s or two F-4s. You know, it gives everyone kind of a equal SA capability in the sections instead of the F-14s having more SA than the F-4s having less SA. 
So that's one of the things we talked about, you know, the first week or two, when I went through, it was a six week class and there was actually a missile shoot involved. You know, the, the Top Gun course changed over the years, but there was actually a missile shoot involved, you know, when you went through as a student in 1980, when I was there. We had some pretty challenging scenarios. We used the China Lake EW range and things like that. You know, and the F-14 had some, uh, I think it was the LRR 45 and 50, you know, that kind of detected things a little bit. So I think we had more SA than the F-4s. And so one of the things we want, uh, you know, a mixed section was to keep the F-4s from being shot down more than the F-14. Although the F-14 is a big airplane and it's a big target to see out there. So I think that's what we, if I remember correctly, employed in my class, you know, not only like section, you know, a little bit on the first week or two, but then we went to mixed section as we got into the more challenging problems, just so that we would have, you know, a better capability of uh, keeping each other safe um, and bringing everybody home. So, so that's power projection. You guys, you right. know, used all the radar modes. They taught you, they emphasize pulse search a lot. I mean, I remember those days. Mm -hmm. So let's go out to the uh, to where the Aug 9's bread and butter was, uh, defending the carrier. Were you guys able to train to that? And I don't mean simulators. I mean, did you do any real uh, carrier air defense, you know, big, big scenarios with jamming and stuff like that? Well, we did uh, a couple things. First, uh, we called it vector logic, was one of the terminologies we used to kind of defend the uh, carrier battle group. And this is because you know, my first squadron tour was, you know, 1979 to 1982. And so we did a lot of uh, exercises on de defending the carrier battle group. But one of the things with the AUG-9, you know, I was thinking about it. We didn't want to kind of give away to the threat when we knew they were there. You know, you wanted to make sure that you had them escorted within, like, say, 100 miles from the carrier. I'm just using that as a nominal. But you then had to be able to, you know, search and see them outside of that, obviously, and be escorting and be on their wing at a designated range. And the AUG-9 was really good for that, you know, because you could get them at, well, I'm not going to talk specific ranges, but over double the range. You know, and if you went in AUG-9, it was a search and it wasn't a lock. So uh, I think we were pretty assured that the you know, bombers didn't know we were there until we showed up. You know, on them, and that was the uh, the good thing of about having a very good trackball scan search radar, you know, and kind of, and then now you the pilot could see that because he could see the tactical information display to do that intercept. But we started out in what we call vector logic, and the threat sector maybe 180 degrees or 160 degrees, and then we had individual strobes every 20 degrees, and we put in uh, two F-14s on each one of those vectors, you know, one outbound, one inbound. So you had somebody looking outbound all the time. And that was just kind of a tactic. And you had to do tanking involved with that because sometimes you try to get the F-14s up there, you know, for four hours, you know, rather than bring them back to the deck. And if you didn't launch your weapons, you know, you needed to kind of have a tanking on station. So we got the tanker involved in there too. So I was co complex. It was kind of like an orchestra, you know, getting every pieces to work. But when it, when it did work well, I th thought we had a really good SA and a wide, you know, scan volume of the carrier to in, inbound threats. Now, Bio, you also asked a question about jamming. We also did deception, too, because we felt, that at least my first deployment operating in the Pacific, that our attack end was 40 degrees off a number of times, you know, kind of spoofing or, or deception. And uh, so we also trained to that, too. We had a good INS in the F-14, which the F-4 didn't have. So it gave us more SA on our positioning and stuff like that. And then we, uh, you could cross-reference a number of things between the radar and what you were seeing on the TACAN and, and your INS as to whether you were being spoofed. You know, with the jamming, we did have EA-3Bs, you know, out there. And it was in one of my missile shoots, we used those too. But they were out there every now and then too, providing jamming. It was usually kind of a hard jamming on a strobe, not necessarily, you know, uh, intermittent jamming uh, initially. The, uh, but you then had to learn to get outside of that jam strobe in order to break out context. So target aspect angle was was critical for things like that. So a number of training opportunities, we did that. One, just to see if we could maintain SA, but then also throw in through an EW and also maybe an occasional spoofing on the TAC end, just to see if you could still maintain your position and maintain SA. So now, Wahoo, let's, 
in, you know, when I was, I, I was flying a few years after you guys were. And so it wasn't really the case, but we used to do a lot of MCON, you know, uh, uh, where the ship would just stop radiating. So they'd turn off the tack and turn off the radios and you'd go off on this long mission. So you're off on your vector logic cap when you're 200 miles away from the ship and you'd come back four hours later and the ship moves, right? And so I remember we'd brief, you know, Civic could come up and the Civic brief, hey, ship's intended position is this. And they give you a lat long. You'd have to come back and and not only was the tech and it was just turned off. Right. And there's no radio. And and you had to come back and find it. Um, I didn't do uh, anytime we did that. It wasn't, you know, the Soviets were not a threat. So if we did it, it, there was always a fallback of like, well, you know, we can always turn it on if we had to. I don't think that was the case when you guys were flying. Right. No, um, I'll tell you, uh, we'll go on this tangent. My first deployment, uh, we we got we were ready to come back from uh, our deployment in November of 1979 after five and a half months to be a six months deployment. And that's when the, um, you know, the uh, Shah got disposed in Iran. OK, and uh, uh, the uh, embassy got taken over and there were hostages. And so we got turned around of. We were had all our weapons offloaded at the Whiskey Pier in the Philippines and started to unload all the furniture that you bring back from deployment. And we got the word for a turnaround. So all this furniture got put back on the pier. We went over to Whiskey uh, and got all our ordnance back on and went through the, you know, Straits of Malacca and uh, and then went into the North Arabian Sea. Now, we didn't even have tanks on the F-14s at that point. We deployed without tanks. And that's another whole story we can get into. How much benefit do you get from those two external tanks with all the drag that it adds with the extra 4,000 pounds of gas, uh, usable fuel, you know, but once we entered the Indian Ocean, we were mandated to put on tanks. And so that was another issue, getting all those tanks working. But then in the North Arabian Sea, yes, we went into a number of those exercises where we had to do MCOM, like you were talking about, Crunch. And we were 250, 300 miles away from the carrier and the carrier wasn't emitting at all. And you had to find your way back, you know, and it was OK if it was a day, you know, good, clear visibility. You know, sometimes you could get close and you could see the carrier. But if the weather wasn't that clear, you had a challenge sometimes. And there were little tricks, you know, you know I'll tell your listeners here. One of the things that we use was ADF, you know, even though the carrier was totally MCON. Sometimes there would be an ADF transmitter off the carrier. And you had a mode in the, in the F-14, not in the radar, but you could actually pick up an ADF strobe at range. And ADF, that would, automatic direction finding. Oh, it's a feature of the UHF radio. And uh, that would give you a vector. Now, you didn't have to have that you know, on on your airplane. But once you got a vector, then you could feel confident coming in from 300 miles out that you'd get inside of 50 miles at the carrier or inside closer and you'd be able to see the carrier. So, yes, we did practice those MCON. And this was because we were preparing for, you know, that the rescue of the hostages there, you know, in 1980. And so we did uh, have those Black Hawk helicopters on our carrier. Uh, wow. the, oh, Kitty Hawk, you know, and we were practicing for that, but they wanted the USS Nimitz to do it. And if you remember, the Nimitz was in the Mediterranean at the time. OK, and we're in the North Arabian Sea. And so but Egypt wouldn't allow the Nimitz to go through the Suez Canal. They had to go all the way out the Med, all the way around Africa to come up to the North Arabian Sea. Now, this is one thing where we have a nuclear carrier, the Nimitz, and we had two nuclear cruisers. And uh, it only took them two weeks steaming at 30 knots continuously to get from East Med all the way to the North Arabian Sea going around Africa. Egypt says you can't go through the Suez Canal. So Nimitz goes, hold my beer. Yep. <laughs> wow. I'll be and so, right there. And, and so it took you, how long again? It took two weeks. Two weeks. So 30 you went knots. All the way out the Med, the Atlantic, all, all the way down. All the way around Africa. Africa, all the way up to the North Arabian Sea. And okay, the Nimbus, this, is, Nimbus is where they launched from. I know we're getting off scope here. No, this bit, is but, alternate history, though. Just okay. imagine if they had let you guys do it. Oh, my gosh. We were training no dust, for it. No dust storm. It, the oh. world would have been different. Gosh. Well, we were training for it. We had the you know helicopters. We put them in the hangar bay because we didn't want any satellites you know, to see that we had these helicopters on board the you know, Kitty Hawk. So I was on the Kitty Hawk. And so the other thing that we were doing at that time, talking about AUG-9, we weren't cleared to go through the Straits of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf yet. We were in the North Arabian Sea. 
but we had A3s that were, you know, listening. These were the EA3s. And we had F-14 escort on these EA-3s. Now, you know, their flight, you know, profile was different than the F-14. You know, they wanted to fly up at higher altitude, faster speed, just because of the engines they had on them. The F-14 with the TF-30, you wanted to fly a little bit lower, the high 20,000s, and slower for max endurance. So, you know, we weren't truly kind of latched onto them. We had to be within close proximity because we didn't know what was going to launch out of Iran. So we kind of kept them in our radar site as they were doing their thing at a higher altitude and going out in front of us. I had to use more of a pulse search at that time because it was going away from us, not coming at. And then when they turned around, then I switched to track while scan and picked them up coming back. And then as as they kind of were coming to come over us, then we did our 180 to stay underneath them and follow them back. So we did this like for two or three hours at a time as an F-14 escort on on these EA-3s, you know, shining on Iran, wondering what they were going to do or trying to listen as we were preparing to for the hostage rescue attempt of the hostages in the uh, embassy in Tehran. Things that, that's a, what a great story that is. I mean, yeah, yeah, things you don't really think about. I mean, I know the you know, you know, the broader context, but this little, little facet of it, you know, never really thought. Well, about see, it. this is the other thing about it. In all our workups, we never trained for that scenario. See, this is the thing when you go on deployment, you never know what you're going to do. Right. We, at that point, Westpac stayed in Westpac. Okay. They didn't even go through the Straits of Malacca. Okay. And so you didn't have tanks on, you just went, you know, around the Western Pacific and you did exercises with the South Koreans and, and also the, uh, you know, Japanese, and then you went into the Philippines and stuff like that. But to go into the Indian Ocean up to the Persian Gulf, we had to really spin up very quickly. You know, Civic really spun up really, that's the Carrier Intelligence Center, Civic, you know, on the new threat that was in the new environment. And we didn't even do this in workup. So we are actually on a whole new, you know, si- you know situation. Now, that turned out to be a 10 and a half de- month deployment on my first deployment because of that. But it was an interesting switching from what we had trained to do to a whole new thing up in the Persian Gulf and what was anticipated there if we were to have carried out that rescue attempt. Man. So, wow. Okay. So let me ask you this. So you're out there, you're, it's 10 and a half months. I mean, you're all over the place. This is not the plan. You know, how are the how are the airplanes holding up over I mean, this? Do you have I well? Mean, let me at tell some you point, this: running out of parts, right? Nope. Are the radar well, still working? Well, this is another blessed thing of having brand new F-14s off the production line, Block 100s. At that point, in the month of December 1979, our squadron flew uh, 450 hours. I had 70 hours in one month in an F-14 just because of all the escorting of the EA-3s and stuff like that. And we had uh, MC rates over 85, 90%, okay? Uh, FMC, maybe about 70%. Those airplanes really held up. They were brand new, brand spanking new. And on my first squadron tour, three hours, and this was the first deployment, you know, there was, you know, we had to keep them up maintenance-wise, but those systems stayed up. Um, They were not, you know, they were new. It was kind of like getting a new car, you know, and stuff like that. And so we were blessed, I think, by having new F-14s. And they were able to, you know, fly and come back and turn around, a hot pump, all that kind of stuff. And we had really good availability. Okay. So for the audience, uh, 70 hours a month, that was unusual. (laughs) But also it it reminds me of what I heard in my first squadron, the previous deployment, VF-24 around 1980, they were out there and they flew uh, a boatload of hours. I mean, in my experience, typical deployments in the 80s, I was flying uh, 30 to 35 hours a right. month, which is still a good pace. That's you know, still a good pace. And, a month and that's typical. Nice. So this was double the normal. And that was yeah. just for two two months, actually, a month and a half, December of 1979 to a little about half of January of 1980 as we were there, you know, until the Nimbus came around to relieve us. And those MC rates, I mean, that's good numbers also. So, Okay. Do you want to go into missile shoots? Let's do it. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. the first one was on that first deployment. I'll do the, uh, the, uh, the AIM-7F. Uh, this was in um, 
August of 79. So we had just left on deployment in June. And this is three months later. And uh, I was flying with Jim DeStaffany and uh, um, the CO chose the two of us, you know, to go do this exercise. It was an F-14 against a Talos missile. Now, for those listeners out there, we still had heavy cruisers. We called them CGs at that time. And they had three air-to-air missiles. They had the uh, the Tartar, which was the short range, the Terrier, the medium range, and the Talos, which was the long range. And the Talos missile really, uh, you know, was a high altitude, 80,000 foot Mach 2.5 missile. So it actually replicated a potential cruise missile threat that we could experience launched off a bear or a badger, a Soviet airplane. So leadership wanted to see if an AIM-7F could, you know, take on one of these and to see if it would work. Cool. Okay. And so this was a new area. We hadn't really tried this yet. And now we're on deployment. We used the Philippine uh, missile range off the north end of, uh, you know, uh, of the Philippines there. Those that did Westpacs know where that is. And uh, it was a setup, about 120 mile setup. You had a heavy cruiser out there that launched it off the ship and uh, we were set up. And so I used PD search. I could actually see the launch of the Talos missile off the ship. Okay. Uh, because of a uh, Doppler. Okay. PD is pulse Doppler pulse search. Doppler okay. search. Okay. And I could see it launch. I could see the target go vertical. Okay. Cause it went pretty much vertical before it went to 80,000 foot, you know, and then, you know, tipped over to get up to speed of Mach two and a half. And so I'm tracking this in PD search. I see it top out and tip over. And then I want to switch to track wall scan because that's a a better capable and the pilot could see that. And another PD mode too, pulse Doppler mode. So now we're at about 120 miles separation. I switched uh, track wall scan. I had the narrow scan because I knew exactly where it was coming from and uh, had a good lock on it, you know, had a good lock on the target coming in. But I don't know, and I've tried to research, you know, what is the limits of the track wall scan on closure, okay, and capability? Oh, they told us that. I mean, we used to know that, but I'm not going to say it either. I'm not going to say the number. But, you know, when it's one thing when you're going maybe Mach 1.8 closure. You have a fighter, fighter doing 0.9. It's another thing when you have a target going 2.5 and you as the fighter going 0.9. You're now up to 3.5, Mach 3.5 closure. So the range is tracking down very quickly. You know, it goes 100, 90, 80, you know, about every four or five seconds in 10 mile increments. So I'm, and so I'm tracking this in track wall scan, you know, and for whatever reason, I still don't know why today at about 60 miles, TWS drop lock. Okay. Oh, I know why. It's an Ogni. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) At drop lock. And now, if you think about it, I don't want to get into classified things, but when you're going that fast, you know, the min launch range is around 38 miles, okay, just because of the closure to give the AIM-9, you know, capable to get out there with its warhead of 40 foot, you know, scissors cut, you know, to do this. So at about 60, 65 miles, the TWS drops lock. And I tell Flex, don't worry, I'm switching to pulse search. Okay, now he can't see what's going on because I'm in pulse search. Pulse. Okay, Okay. because I I knew the altitude. I knew exactly where it was. So I knew how many degrees up to look. Right, because they taught us to do that elevation calculation. Exactly. Okay. So within five, within about two or three seconds, I had a pulse search track and I took a pulse lock. And now it had gone down to about 48 miles, okay? And in that short a time, from 65 to 48 because of the closure, and we had about six seconds to launch the missile before we got inside min range. Mm -hmm. And Flex let me take it. I took it. And we took it about, you know, four or five miles outside min range. And the range control said it was a a lethal kill because it passed within 30 feet of the target. And the AIM-7F had a 40-foot kill uh, warhead. Yeah, wahoo! That would have been that would have been a uh, a heart stopper scenario. It was a track. heart stopper. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm feeling so comfortable in PD search and track wall scan, and then all light up a cigarette. Everything just goes to crap. You know, and that's the thing you have to be prepared for. You know, and that's what they trained you know, in, in Top Gun, and also, and that's what we tried to train our students. You never know what's going to happen because things could change in a second, and you so have that to ain't be seven. So you. 
it launched. Did you go heads up after your radar work is done and watch? Did you see anything or? What we did is, of course, it didn't have a live warhead on it, so there wasn't an explosion. Okay, but we did see the AIM-7 launch and it immediately went up. So we knew it was tracking, okay, because now we're 48, 45 miles and we're at 27,000 and the Talos is at 80,000. So it had to really pull a nose up and we saw the AIM-7 really pull up. So we knew it was tracking on the target. And I had a solid lock, a solid pulse lock until I saw on the radar intercept or range get down to zero. Time of flight counter goes to zero. Yeah. Yep. If they had time of flight counters in the early, did they have those in the early tapes? I m't we had them um, but not, you may not, have even, not yeah. in not in that ep, not in that not for that missile shoot we didn't have it this was 79 okay. I did not did not have that but we did yeah. have we we may or may not I can't remember by all I really don't know okay but I just watched the range countdown and I could yeah. see it uh, on my PD on my uh, DDD in pulse search I could see the range closure and I knew when it went to, to zero. And you were you were a first tour, first tour, Lieutenant Nugget, JG, JG. I had just completed the RAG in January of seventy nine, and this is August of seventy nine. Cool. And so, nice you know, job. And so uh, that's the thing. When I had command of a squadron, and I told my JOs, you know, you, I, I got the missile exercises right in the beginning. I said, you don't know what we're going to get involved in, and I wanted my Nuggets just as trained as my my department heads when I had command of a squadron, just from my experience as a nugget myself. Wow. That's cool. So that was, a, so that was that, an AIM-7. That was AIM-7. Let me go to an AIM-54. Okay. This now was in February of 81. So I had gone through Top Gun. I went through Top Gun in March to May of 1980. And now I'm on my second deployment. And uh, we had the missile allocation for that fiscal year of 81. We had about 12 missiles. And now if you're in a squadron, you know, that's a lot of missiles in, in one year. You know, a combination of Phoenix and Sparrows and Sidewinders. Typically today, I don't know what it is, but getting 12 per squadron, you know, that was pretty good. And so our allocation was two AIM-54, you know, maybe five or six Sparrows and the rest Sidewinders or something like that. And so the CEO, Stu Schmidt, uh, at the time said, you know, I want to challenge a couple JO air crew to come up. I want to shoot two AIM-54 on one flight. Well, this really had a lot of angst amongst the squadron because they said, well, if we had one AIM-54 on two different flights, then we could have four air crew, okay, exposed to an AIM-54 launch instead of one air crew getting two missiles, you know, off an airplane. But the SEAL wanted to challenge this scenario. And so my pilot was Mike Pappy Pappenthien, uh, for those that may know Pappy out there. And uh, we were uh, a team. And then there was two other JOs. And it was all lieutenants. Uh, the CEO didn't want any lieutenant commanders involved. This was all JOs to come up with a scenario to employ two Phoenix against two targets with a standoff jammer. That was the uh, scenario. Okay. And so we- so not not straightforward. Not straightforward. Nope. No. So uh, ours was chosen as the, uh, as the best option. So I uh, blessed again to be in an F-14 that was going to launch two AIM-54. So this was off the Pacific Missile Test Range. And- uh, the range, you know, range clearance is a challenge sometimes. So well, we launched off the carrier again. So this was workups. This wasn't out of Miramar up to the Pacific Missile Test Range. This was off the Kitty Hawk to the uh, missile range and then back. And uh, because the missile range took a while to get cleared, we had to get tanked, okay, while we were waiting for range clearance and things like that. So this was all kind of real world scenario stuff. You're not going to launch right away. You may have to get tanked several times before you may co be called into the uh, into the threat. Anyway, the, the range finally got cleared. They got the jammer up there, which was a uh, an e, uh, EA-3B jammer. And we had two BQM-74 drones uh, that were the targets. So they were high subsonic, 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And um, I'm trying to remember, um, it was about a, um, maybe about a hundred uh, mile setup or something like that, you know, pretty much the max because they wanted to give us time. When you have a jammer that's 40 miles standoff from the two targets, it provides a pretty big uh, jamming strobe out there. And you have to get enough target aspect angle, TA as we called it, to break out those targets from the jammer. 
Okay, but you also have to stay within the uh, the uh, envelope of the missile. You couldn't get too far out uh, target aspect angle because the AIM-54 did not have a beam shot at range. You had to be within the uh, the envelope of the AIM-54. So that was the scenario. And uh, so initially, uh, we took a lot of aggressive cut to get target aspect angle, you know, and these are subsonic targets. So this is very different than the buzzard X I was talking to you about earlier. This is a 0.7 target and we're doing 0.7. So this is uh, only about a 1.4 mock closure, which is a lot different than 3.5 mock closure. So the range counts down a lot more slowly on something like this. But we got one target to break out at about, you know, maybe 60 miles or something like that of the target. And we were trying to get the second target broken out because our goal, our scenario, what we had proposed was to get the two targets, okay? Mm -hmm. Break them out of the jammer and get two clear targets broken out and launch the AIM-54s at the targets. That was the, that was the plan. But what happened was the jam strobe was so big, we got to a target aspect, I didn't wanna go anymore. We had one clear target and I was only occasionally breaking out the other target. All this was in tar track wall scan. I couldn't have done this in PD search or, or pulse search. This whole missile shoot was done in track wall scan. And we were launching two, we we're launching two at the same time, so they had to be supported in track wall scan anyway. So we got to about 40 miles, still getting intermittent breaking out on the second, more getting it broken out than not. So I said, this is where we're gonna launch uh, between 40 and 35. So we launched the one AIM-54, and saw it do its thing, three seconds launch to eject, really does an aggressive maneuver, climbs to altitude. And then I had a second track wall scan track and I launched the second one and it launched and that Phoenix did its thing too. But shortly after that, I lost it in the jam strobe. Okay. So you what lost the target. I lost the target in the jam strobe just because of you know where we were trying to keep it illuminated and everything. And so the range comes back about 15 seconds later saying, I'm scramming the jammer. Because what happened was the first AIM-54 was going against the BQM, but the second AIM-54 switched to home on jam. <laughs> and the AIM-54 had this capability you know, to do that, as you know. If you were going in and it couldn't find its target and was a jammer out there, it would switch to home on jam and go after the jammer. Wahoo, you're going to be famous. <laughs> And so now we have this AIM-54 going against the jammer. Now, the jammer was 40-mile standoff, so the range control had plenty of time to do this. And they didn't want to lose the jammer. And even though these AIM-54 did not have live warheads, that AIM-54 on home on jam would have been a direct kinetic kill. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so they had to scram the jammer so that it wouldn't kill the AIM, shoot down the uh, EA-3B. And so what the range control determined was a, a good kill on the first one on a BQM, because that got within the lethal envelope, and a good kill on a jammer. Now, <laughs> that wasn't the design. The design was to get the two BQM, but we still got two kills. And coming back in debriefing, I said, you know, it was easier then to get that second target because now there wasn't a jammer. The ship could have launched a sea sparrow or something like that against a target coming in without a jammer. So our, our scenario was deemed a success, even though it didn't shoot down what it was intended to. It shot down the jammer, too, but then it made it easier to get that second target by something else. God. That, and nothing, if nothing else, I mean, you get some data from that and everybody learns from it. They're like, OK, so right. don't forget it has this mode. That and, the, and the thing is, then you come back to land on the carrier. And I know, of course, I wasn't in combat, obviously, at that time. But when you're exhilarated because you had a good missile shoot and then have to come back and land on the carrier, as you know, Crunch, you then have to get your mind focused, you know, to do an OK3 pass, even though you're full of uh, adrenaline from having a good missile shoot. So, Oh, yeah. And if you're not careful, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> I'm the best ever. <laughs> So in, in my and first, sometimes you might throw a bad pass. <laughs> right. So uh, that was a really, a really interesting, uh, a missile shoot. And, uh, man, that is what great experience as a J.O. So, so that was still in one eleven. your first squadron tour. Right. Uh, That's now awesome. I've, yep. This so was you my got three, you shot three missiles in your first J.O. tour. Is that right? Um, well, probably in my first J.O. tour, closer to 10. 
Okay. And the reason for that, uh, I was in the squadron for three years and I was a lucky spare. Uh, you guys may know this, you know, that you always had a spare. And on two missile shoots, the squadron had that, uh, you know, AIM 7s, AIM 9s, end of the fiscal year, had to launch them. Um, they happened to load us up as the spare with three missiles, uh, just in case one of the ones went down. And so one of the primary airplanes went down. I got launched on a spare and we had to launch the missiles because they were in our fiscal year allotment. So just on one flight and they were you know, aim, two AIM nines and an AIM seven, more in an ACM environment type of thing. So in my three year uh, JO tour, I think it was like 10 missiles. Uh, Crunch in my uh, JO tour in 81 to 84, I shot at least five or six missiles, but they were all AIM nines and AIM sevens. My Phoenix missile, uh, the AUG-9 died, and the spare launched his, launched the missile on that one. So I didn't well, shoot. You guys Phoenix. shot a lot more than I did. I, I, I've i I've shot two AIM-54, an AIM-7, and an AIM-9 in my entire career. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, the, it was the 80s, man. Well, the, er, the eight, early 80s, uh, <laughs> we had the money. Um, it was still the uh, Blue Water Ops. It was yep. still the Soviet threat. It was still an environment where we had, you know, to, you know, keep us trained for that environment. We had plenty of missiles for missile shoots, you know, on things like that. That was 80, 79 to 82 on my first squadron tour. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. So different time. Okay. I, I didn't, I didn't get to, I didn't get to do all that myself. I remember my first missile X, uh, well, shoot, I, get, I had a couple, but you know, there were, there were more than one time where I know I should, launched on a missile X and never actually got to shoot for one reason or another, right. whether, uh, you know, target range was foul. Uh, I, I know one time where we had the missile failed mm -hmm. and then launch. Uh, but, uh, you know, different time, like you said. All right. So the one thing we haven't talked about yet was after this. So you had this amazing first tour in 111. Sounds great. Right. And then you go off and you became a Top Gun instructor. Right. And, you know, that's a whole new experience. You're there in Miramar, which is awesome. Uh, so what was what was your SME area, your subject matter expert area? My subject matter expert was uh, friendly forces. You know, we had a, uh, a lecture that, you know, was all threat except for one threat lectures in Top Gun. And one, we had to just give all the students uh, an appreciation to all the friendly forces out there. You know, we have all these surface to air missiles on cruisers. We had B-52s. We had things like that. So there was a presentation called friendly forces. Who did you take that, that over from? I took it from Snake James. Okay. Brent James snake okay and so i did that but then also top gun was developing a program called fast fleet air superiority training and this was the outer air battle uh vector logic that i talked about earlier uh that we had done and so this was a a course that we took we had two rios mike dankler and myself and then we had our intel jan dundas uh who was our intel and we went we briefed every f-14 squadron east and west coast on fleet air superiority training. We spent a week with them. We did simulators, uh, challenging simulators, outer air battle, outer air battle with uh, jam strobes and you know all that kind of challenge and things like that, gave them lectures. So there were several lectures I gave with outer air, uh, with FAST, the outer air battle, how to maintain position, you know, how to do this vector logic. Chainsaw was another term that we used at that time as far as, uh, you know, uh, always having someone facing outbound, had tanking coming into the thing, you know, station keeping, situational awareness, all those kind of things. So there was a number of different lectures and simulator training that uh, I was involved in with Mike Tankler and Jan Dundas. And so that, that, that you know, we actually didn't take, sometimes we took airplanes to Oceana to, flew, to fly against the, uh, the squadrons in the East Coast. As you remember, Top Gun at that time, or maybe you don't, uh, since uh, you were after that crunch. But one thing we did more than Top Gun did later and does now, we did ACM against fleet squadrons. We took our A4s and F5s and uh, spent, you know, maybe a week or four or five days. We went to Yuma, uh, flew, flew against the Marines, the F4s there. And then later when they got some of the F18s, we went to Oceana, took a couple F5s and an A4 and flew against the East Coast F14 squadrons as adversaries. I know there were adversary squadrons out there, but we provided as Top Gun more challenging scenarios and, and a different type of threat and also lectures uh, along with that. So sometimes with our fast trips to the East Coast, you know, a couple other SMEs went and talked AIM-9, AIM-7 lecture, as well as we talked outer air battle. And then we flew against the East Coast uh, 
pilots and Rios and East Coast squadrons when we went to Oceana. So that's what I did for uh, uh, a little over two years, um, friendly forces and fast fleet air superiority training. Well, that's cool. That's awesome. That's interesting. So it all, it all kind of comes together. That's awesome. Okay. Well, so uh, how come, did you uh, make, an, did you apply to be an astronaut? Well, this is how that worked out. Okay, uh, let me go back to that a little bit. I really wanted to go to the moon. That's what I really wanted to do because that's what the goal was, you know. And then in 1972, actually, I'm in college, and we stopped going to the moon. You know, the, the uh, Gemini Apollo missions got canceled. You know, so now I get into my f- first fleet squadron, and I'm all lined up because Stu Schmidt was a test pilot school grad. He's one that went to test pilot school and came back operational again, did not stay in the acquisition community and stay in Pax River. So he was ready to really nominate me and send me to test pilot school, which then would have been what I would needed to be to go to be an astronaut. But at that point, now we're doing space shuttles, okay, to the International Space Station. And all I would be doing was experiments, you know, as a Rio and not actually going to the moon. And so I'm going... That's not really what I had envisioned of being an astronaut. I really wanted to go to the moon. So now I told the skipper, uh, Stu Schmidt, I said, okay, this was after I had gone to Top Gun. I said, if I get orders to Top Gun, I'm going to Top Gun. If I don't get orders to Top Gun, then I'll go to test pilot school. And as you know, I got, I was in Australia at the time. Uh, We were on a port visit when I got my orders to Top Gun. Uh, that I notified at the Top Gun. So I told Stu Schmidt, I said, well, I'm taking these. I'm, I'm going to go to Top Gun instead of test pilot school. So that's the end of that story as far as being an astronaut. But it got me into fighters and it got me into F-14s. Uh, but then things change. You can't escape your fate. Nope, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, Wahoo. We've had a great time talking with you. We've asked you a few dozen questions. Do you have anything else uh, on your mind that we didn't ask you? We might have covered it all already. Um, Do you have anything else? You know, um, I will just say this. It's not really an AUG-9 or an F-14 thing. But, you know, when I was in Top Gun, I got a chance sometimes to fly, you know, in the backseat of a Phantom. Okay, so I have exchange because I got a Rio, a Phantom Rio got to fly in an F-14, you know, or an F-5F, you know, you, yep. may, you, you may know that bio. Yep, I did that. You know, and so I got an, F, uh, an F-18D an f hop. I got one flight in an F-18D, and I also got two or three flights in an F-4 Phantom in the back. Um, but one of the things, and I'll just tell this, it's not, nothing about all guy, but this is an interesting story, and I won't use names on this, but one of the things when we flew against the Marines in Yuma, you know, uh, a lot of times this was not, since we're not in a class and you know this bio and crunch, you know this too. A lot of times they'd let the Rios fly the F5 from the back, you know, or actually direct yep. the flight. So when we're flying against the Marine F4s, you know, my pilot wouldn't let me uh, control the, in, the F5 in close, but he'd let me call all the shots. He put his, you know, hands on the handrails, let me fly it in close and then took it if when it got in close. And, you know, the F5F did not have a HUD in the back, but we were rolling in on this one F4 uh, for a gunshot. And uh, my pilot said, you can call it, you can call it guns, you know, on the F4. (laughs) And so, because I got him into that position. So in the debrief, I had the F4 crew said, who was that F5 and that F5, you know, that gunned me? And uh, my pilot said, oh, it was the Rio. The Rio was flying the airplane. He's the one that gunned you. (laughs) Ouch. A little bit of humble pie. (laughs) (laughs) But but, but those are the kind of things as Top Gun instructors we got a chance to do, and you guys know that. Uh, All safe, all above board, but just some some interesting times and some of the things we did. You know, and that really gave more SA awareness. That crew, I think, started checking their six a lot better than they ever had before. So that was the learning environment, and that was the goal, you know, to get them, you know, to to uh, make sure they check their full 360 for the threat and not just what's in front of them. Yep. Well, we'll tell you what, Wahoo, that this was, that's a great story. And this is, uh, this has been an amazing interview. I tell you, um, I, I personally have, I, 
I love hearing hearing stories about things like that, the missile X and th- thinking about, you know, as bio said, the alternate history of what could have been had Egypt let you guys go through the Suez. There's so much, uh, you know, this has just been a, been a great time. And I really appreciate you coming out. And, uh, this has been a, been a real education for me for sure. And, uh, bio as well. I'm, I'm, I'm sure over to you, sir. Good to see you again, Wahoo. Thanks for spending time with us today. You're welcome, Bio. My pleasure. All right, Bio. That was uh, that was a great interview. Did uh, that bring back some memories for you? Yeah, Wahoo covered a few things that I had almost forgotten. I, sh- I assure you, I used to actually know them. Crunch, one thing I think we need to clarify is uh, he used the term CVIC. CVIC is the uh, Carrier Intelligence Center with CV being the abbreviation for a carrier. That's right. And, you know, that's uh, you bring up a good point. So we would always call it civic. And it really did kind of look like the movies. I mean, you got the you got everybody running around, people talking about high level stuff. You got video screens, maybe even some some live chat and stuff. And and uh, a lot of times, you know, pilots and Rios would have to go down there and do debriefs to the Intel folks and everything after after a mission. Uh, and I mean, you would even spin tapes and things and, and show them to the Intel folks and record it, right? Oh yeah, Civic was uh, Civic was one of the hubs of activity on the carrier, so that was cool. And uh, Wahoo mentioned, you know, uh, how, how he spent some time in there. So yeah, awesome. All right, well, hey, that wraps it up for today. This was episode three. I'd love to see you all and hear you all uh, in about two weeks. We're going to do episode four, flying the F-14 with Slammer Richardson. See you all then. <laughs>